We meet on the lands of the Derenjan people of the Yuan Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. My name's Ian Campbell from About Regional, a new digital platform for the news and stories of Southern New South Wales. Welcome to everyone here at the Bega Civic Centre or watching online. Welcome to the Women in Science Forum, a special online conversation with Dr. Credwin Fraser an event that is supported by the Sapphire Coast Science Hub and Inspiring Australia. Over the next 30 minutes, we are all going to be inspired about the work of CRID. And hopefully a few ladies and men in the room will be inspired into a career in science. CRID, I'm gonna embarrass you first of all as a way of getting us started today. Talk about all your achievements and your amazing career. Dr. Credwin Fraser is an Associate Professor in the Department of Marine Science at the University of Otago in New Zealand. Credwin will give her perspectives this morning on opportunities for women in marine science and Antarctica, plus details about her own scientific heroines. She has extensive experience of tertiary education institutions, having worked and or studied at six universities across three countries. Crid has won several awards, including the ACT Science of the Year Award. Are you blushing yet? It's hard yeah, a little to bit. Be amongst yeah. those <laughs> I've got good contrast, you can't see. <laughs> She's also won the Australian Academy of Sciences Fenner Medal and the International Biography Society's MacArthur and Wilson Award. She was part of ANU's delegation to the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2018. Her research interests include understanding how plants and animals can travel across oceans, how volcanoes might have helped species survive ice ages in Antarctica, how species recover after big disturbances like earthquakes, and the impacts of altered species distribution with climate change. One of her new projects will use genetics to understand what is happening to kelp populations as they shift south with global sea warming focusing on species of kelp that are found in southeastern Australia and its northern limit near Tarthra, but this seaweed is heading south. We've got lots to talk about this morning, Crid. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> so tell us a bit about yourself uh, in the first instance, Crid. Did I miss anything there that we should know about? Uh, not that I can think of, no. I, look, I, I'm, I'm Australian originally. I grew up in Canberra. Um, and I actually only just moved to New Zealand about two months ago. So I'm fresh off the boat and I'm pra practicing my accent. Um, but uh, it's, it's lovely to be on this side of the ditch. There's lots of marine and Antarctic science going on over here. So that was kind of a big part of the motivation for moving over to the eastern part of the world um, is to, to connect with so much marine and Antarctic research that's going on over here. Oh, really great to tap into that. Whereabouts are you this morning, Creed? Can you take us on a bit of a tour of where you are? Yeah, sure. So I'm in the Marine Science Research Centre at the University of Otago. And that's um, a special research facility that has been built out on the peninsula. Otago is, is, has a lovely harbour. It's got beautiful beaches as well, but a nice sheltered harbour. And they've built this amazing marine research center. So I'm currently in the teaching lab. I've got you on a trolley so I can wheel you around. And it's set up for lots of students to study undergraduate marine science courses here. It's kind of unfortunate though, because it's got the most amazing views you can imagine, which must make it really hard for students, I think, to focus on studying when they're doing classes in this room. I'll just try to see if I can get you to see the views. We're getting a nice sense of it, yeah. Move this broom. So what's that behind you, Crid? What body of water are we looking at? So this is the Otago Harbour. Is it coming out all right or is the contrast too strong? Let's see if I can move you forward and get it a little better. Are there facilities like this here in Australia? Is there somewhere comparable here in Australia? Sure, there are certainly universities with, with strong focus on marine research in Australia, and some of them have marine research stations. Um, up in Sydney, there are several universities that do very well in marine science and have marine research stations. Um, further up north, James Cook is a great place to study marine science. And, um, and I can think of some in sort of Coffs Harbour area as well, and Hobart. So, so there are lots of places, obviously Canberra where I grew up was maybe not the uh, most suitable place to want to be a marine biologist, but um, 
that might have been part of the inspiration in the end because I found myself going down to the coast all the time and I realised that's what I was most excited about, studying the ocean. Can you tell us a bit more about what's going on in, in Kiwiland? What got you there? Where is this focus on marine science coming from in New Zealand that drew you to the University of Otago? What are they doing that, that got you there? Uh, they're very close to Antarctica here and I do love cold climates and icy, wild, sub-Antarctic environments. So um, for my PhD and my first postdoc, I spent a lot of time traveling to the sub-Antarctic islands where it's windy, cold, covered in albatrosses and penguins. And to be honest, the southern part of New Zealand is just like a sub-Antarctic island. Um, where I am right now in Dunedin, we have an albatross colony about 10 minutes drive away from where I'm sitting. Um, there are several species of penguins that roost around here that come in and, and um, form colonies. We've got little blue penguins and the New Zealand yellow-eyed penguin. And over on the other side of New Zealand, there are crested penguins. We sometimes get king penguins standing on the beaches. We get um, leopard seals. There are sea lions. There's all sorts of... We've even had um, killer whales coming into the harbour. So for somebody who loves the sub-Antarctic and these cold water marine species, it's a really great place to be based. I can, on my, on my cycle from home to work, I can see many of the things that really get me passionate about marine science and Antarctic science. So that's part of what drew me over. And um, the other part of it is I think New Zealand's very focused on building research in science um, and they're investing in research in science. And right now I wouldn't necessarily say Australia's trending in the same direction. <laughs> And of course, New Zealand's got that fabulous Prime Minister. Well, that's right. I'm very smug about my new Prime Minister, um, especially looking at what I've come from. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've, you've shown us the view, you've shown us the classroom. We haven't talked about the critters behind you. They've just been fed. Tell us about the, um, the, the fish tanks behind you. Yes, I thought this would be a nice place to be based for this talk because you can see a little bit of the marine life without struggling too much. We've got some crayfish here in the tanks, and as you say, they've just been fed, so they're really quite excited about that, clambering all over the place. They can smell the food, they want to eat it. I don't think they're finding it very effectively. Just one at the back there seems to be in the middle of eating, and the others are wandering around looking for the amazing smells. And then there's some sea stars over here and cockles. Um, I suppose they're kept separate to the others in case they eat each other. And then down the end, there's some uh, fish, or as I should say, fush, um, and pull stars. Um, let me see if I can get some fish. There's some there. So these tanks are here, as far as I know, just for, um, just for inspiring the students who come to study in this lab. I was thinking that perhaps lobsters are the rats and mice of the marine science world, but that's not, not the case. Oh, no, I wouldn't go that far. They're quite beautiful, really. <laughs> Who were some of the um, heroines or heroes of the science world that got you interested in this career? Crude, how did you start out on this path? Um, well, I suppose um, po probably the most influential heroine in my life would be the, uh, my grandmother. And, and, and it's funny because I actually didn't get along with her that well. Um, but she was an amazing woman and she was uh, a female scientist at a time when females weren't really welcome in the science world and they certainly weren't encouraged to be scientists. So she really fought her way through university, got her Doctor of Science degree. And then um, because she lived in an era when once you got married, you didn't really work anymore, um, she, she really sort of gave it up. She kept, she kept some connection with her science, but um, had, to, had to give a lot of it up. And I think she always regretted that and wished that she had had more opportunity to stay in research. Um, but I guess because I grew up with a role model like that, somebody who had become a scientist um, despite being a woman, I never saw it as something that I couldn't do. Um, and I never felt, all the way through my career so far, I never felt disadvantaged for being a woman. Uh, I know there aren't very many women who carry on all the way through in science. We have a lot of 
people, uh, a lot of girls who study science um, at undergrad at university, and then it seems to drop off from there. And now that I'm further on in my career, I can kind of see that there are challenges that we face. There are a lot of inherent biases, and that's probably the biggest problem. You know, they've done studies that show that um, if you take a scientific paper and send it out to review, which is what happens with the scientific process, people, as a scientist, I write my results up in a formal paper, I send it to a journal for publication, and then it goes out to other scientists for them to comment on. And only if they're happy with it, will it pass into publication. But there've been studies that show that the same paper will receive much more critical reviews if the first author is listed as a woman than if the first author is listed as a man. So there are all these inherent biases that women scientists have to face as they go through that impact on their capacity to go further in their careers. But we're very conscious of those now and there's been a lot of research on them. So I don't think the challenges are going to remain as strong in the future. And it's certainly a lot better now for me than it was in my grandmother's time. When you say we're conscious of those biases, what's happening to, to challenge that mindset in, in people? What have you come across that, that sort of busts those biases open? Well, some, some universities now have um, gender equity uh, rules, which might say, for example, that if two people are equally qualified for a job and they're the top two listed candidates, but one is a woman and the other's a man, it should go to the woman. And that's partly because we've started to see that even when the woman is better qualified, sometimes she won't get the job just because people have these inherent biases. So introducing rules that say, well, if she's better qualified or as qualified as the, the top candidate, then you've got to give the woman the job. And that might seem discriminatory to men, but I think the men have so many other um, uh, support systems to get them to where they are in their careers that it doesn't really work out being discriminatory it just levels the playing field as a as a human how have you coped with that during your career when you've come up against those biases up against those attitudes i mean that stuff can get you down can be upsetting have you had that sort of experience how did you get through it i moved to new zealand <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it, it is quite confronting when you start to see um, things like that happening in the workplace around you. And um, I tend to speak up about it if I see it. Um, and I think it's only through people speaking up about it more and more that these things start to get recognised and addressed appropriately. And some institutions are better than others at dealing with them. Um, every institution likes to say that it's very good at dealing with um, at promoting gender equity, uh, but when it comes to the crunch, some of them aren't so good in practice as in theory. So it's, it's worth keeping an eye on. There are now um, things like the SAGE gender equity group, which is kind of like a qualification that an institution can get um, about how good it is at promoting gender equity. And most institutions want to be able to say on their webpage that they're highly rated through this qualification. Um, and that's good because it means that they have to work hard to meet the criteria um, and, and, and that means they actually have to address gender equity issues head on. What are the little things that um, educators can do, schools can do, that people in general can do to challenge those biases? Do you know, I have a, I have a four-year-old at the moment and it's been quite um, strange seeing the, um, the gender ideas he picks up from other kids. So I think a lot of this starts right at the beginning when we, when we teach children about um, gender differences or similarities. Um, you know, my son picked up some lovely sparkly um, princess shoes in the shop and begged me to buy them for him, so I did. And then he wore them to childcare. And then that evening he came back and he said, I can't wear those anymore. Those are girls' shoes. And I thought that was kind of really sad that, that he'd been told that, that this was something he couldn't do because of his gender. And I think girls get that all the time, right from the day they're born. There are things they're told they should be doing or shouldn't be doing. And sometimes it's very subtle. People don't realize they're doing it. They just, um, when, when they see a kid in a, in a playroom, they say, you know, let's go play. And they, if it's a girl, they gravitate towards the dolls. They don't necessarily gravitate towards the trucks. And they might not even realize they're doing that. 
So there are a whole lot of like, just, just being aware of the way we treat women and men and um, right at the early stage, the way we say that girls are weaker than men. You know, my, my son was telling me yesterday that boys are stronger than girls. I'm like, what the, <laughs> you know, he's four years old and he's already got these preconceived ideas about what girls can or can't do. Um, so we deal with this all the way through from, from childcare age right up to um, university and beyond. And um, I see it a lot in high levels in Australian politics, for example, the way we treat women compared to men. So these are um, high profile role models that we should be promoting to Australian kids and, and probably aren't doing as much as we could be in that area. I'm keen to talk to you about your work soon the Bonda Environmental Education Centre has sent you some seaweed from Tartra that you've been studying in recent days and I'm keen to ask you a bit about that soon but just staying with this idea of gender equity especially when it comes to science what do you think the difference is between what women bring to the lab what women bring to science and what men bring to science is there a, a different we are we are very different what do women bring to science that is different to what men bring to science um, I'm not sure that the differences are, are super clear cut. There is some research that suggests that women tend to engage more in mentoring activities than men as scientists. So that's quite a valuable um, thing that they bring that isn't always measured on CVs. Um, so they're more likely to um, chat with people who are struggling and try to find a way to help them. Um, but, but on the whole, I think the capacity of women to do science is just as good as that of, of men. Um, and everybody has a different approach. So some people are great at analyses, some people are great at writing, some people are, excel at the, you know, coming up with creative ideas, um, hypotheses. But I don't know that that's a gender difference. I think that's more an individual difference. Um, so I can think of lots of things that are different um, in my approach to that of some of my male role models, but I wouldn't necessarily say that that's a gender difference. That's just, I'm really good at those aspects. They're really good at those aspects. And that's why science is highly collaborative. But um, more and more, we're starting to see people focus on um, gender equity, even when, when you're applying for a grant, um, for example, you might get a comment back saying, you know, you've, you've got an all male team here. Why should we fund you? So, it's, it's in the spotlight and it's something that's changing. And I think that will filter through to, to make it a level playing field for the future. We're here at the Bega Civic Centre with a bunch of students from Bega High. There's a bunch of people watching online at home as well. If you're watching online at home and you have a question for Crid, please just type it into the screen and we'll do our best to get Crid to answer it. Crid, tell us about your work at the moment. You've been sent uh, a box of seaweed from Tartha, bull kelp, I think it is. I might be right there. What's going on with the bull kelp? Why are you interested in, in kelp from Tartha? Yes, so I'm actually getting paid for this in kelp. That's, that's the currency <laughs> we deal with in science. Um, I got a box of kelp yesterday, I think it was, yesterday morning, from the Tartha area. And I've been trying to get some samples from that area for quite a long time. And they're particularly interesting because um, we know with climate change, as, as the... Um, air and the water is warming, many plants and animals are starting to move towards the poles. So in the southern hemisphere, that means plants and animals are starting to move south. And so the distribution is changing. So where you used to have this particular kelp species occurring quite far up the New South Wales coast, it still occurs all the way down um, to the bottom of Tasmania. Now that is shifting southwards. So the northern limit is changing. So we no longer see this kelp occurring quite as far north as it used to occur. And but that's happening for many different species. Warm up north, is that what you mean? That's right. So the waters are warming and they warm more towards the tropics, of course, relatively. So if you're something that has a, let's say you have a thermal tolerance maximum of 16 degrees, you just can't occur as far north as you used to as the waters warm. So they're starting to shift south. And I'm interested in that from a genetic perspective because... Um, as, as species change their distributions, the ones that are right at the limit of what they can survive are under a lot of stress. Um, so I want to see, do we have lower genetic diversity in those populations to populations that are sort of happy and have a lot of 
um, a lot of environment that they're very comfortable with. So we might see lower genetic diversity and we also might see particular um, genes or particular genotypes that suggest that those plants that are hanging out further north are able to survive in warmer waters. And that could be important for managing these populations into the future. Because if we know that if we try to do transplantation experiments to get kelp to grow somewhere where, where it's gone from, then you might want to choose some plants that um, have DNA that's suitable for those warmer climates. So that's why we've got kelp sent from Tatra. Um, and I've also collected samples or had samples collected for me from right around the distribution of this kelp down the coast of Tasmania and um, in Western Victoria as well. We should give a special shout out to Luke Brown, who's the scientist at the Bonda Environmental Education Centre, who put his toe in the cold water of Tartra to get you that seaweed. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Luke. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, what, are you, what stresses are you seeing on that environment as the environment changes with the warming ocean? And you, you mentioned that, the, I guess, the habitat of the bull kelp is, is constructed is contracting, is, is shrinking. What stresses are you seeing go with that? Uh, well, at the northern limit, uh, the plants are smaller, they're, they're more straggly, the populations are less dense. Um, and that's true of most species that are shifting their distributions. So we, we, we get more, generally more abundant um, populations in the centre of the range of species where they're not under too much environmental pressure. Um, this is a species that doesn't float very well, so it is hard for it to shift its distribution very far. And that's something to worry about into the um, future, I think, because you've got um, this species that is shifting south, but at the bottom of Australia, there's just a big ocean before it um, hits Antarctica. So there's not really anywhere for the kelp to go if it, if it starts to move too far south. It can track the coastline, but beyond that, it can't really make a jump. There's another species in the same genus of kelp, which is really, really good at floating. It's um, super buoyant. I'm trying to see if I've got a photo of it here somewhere uh, that I could share with you. Let me see. Share, wait, let me pull up the photo first. So, why isn't that working? Hang on a sec. You're all right. My apologies. If you're at home watching and you've got a question for Crid, please tap it up onto the screen and we'll ask our audience here in the Civic Centre soon if they have a question for you. So this is a, um, a buoyant kelp species that grows around the, the sub-Antarctic and the Falkland Islands. That's me in the Falkland Islands collecting it. Um, the very large machete type knife which absolutely freaks people out when they're having picnics on the beach and I turn up wielding a giant knife to chop kelp with but this this kelp is really it floats super well and it can travel right around um, the southern ocean so I've been studying that one for quite a long time um, looking at how it can travel vast distances across the ocean and I'm afraid I haven't got heaps and heaps of photos of it i didn't prepare a picture of the bull kelp from from tarthra crude it might be something we sorry do you have a picture of the bull kelp from tarthra so that we can see if we if we know it if, if it's familiar to us no i don't have a picture of it but it looks very much like that the only difference with this and the one at tarthra is that it has slightly wider fronds so this one looks a bit like spaghetti the one at tarthra looks a bit more like lasagna. <laughs> and the stuff at Tartra, does it grow quite deep in the water or would we know it from the shallows of Tartra Beach? So you know the the hotel on top of up the top of Tartra and, and sort of and then it drops down there, there's a there's a path that got closed off after the bushfires but you used to be able to sort of walk down I don't know if it's opened up again you can walk down from the hotel the back of the hotel and then down along the back of the cliffs. Yes. Um, just down there, you'd be able to see it at low tide, just sticking out of the water. So it's slightly intertidal at low tide. And given that you're looking at the genetics of this seaweed, you're looking for the, the fittest of its species in a way, are you? That's part of it, yeah. And, and also just trying to understand not so much only about the kelp, but how, 
how populations respond to changing environments. So this is kind of broader than only thinking about the kelp, but using the kelp as a model to try to understand how, um, how evolution is affected by these distributional changes, how genes are um, important to the survival of the species in some area, but also how we get differences in patterns of genetic diversity across spatial scales. You alluded to it before, almost sort of a, a land management approach to our ocean, going in there and planting seaweed in a way that, that your research is, is sort of feeding this sort of knowledge and perhaps that sort of project down the track? Or, or are we out there now farming seaweed, planting seaweed in the ocean? In the yeah, some, pe some people are, absolutely. It's not really the stuff I do, but um, as you say, the things that I'm working on can help to inform how we do that. Um, but no, there were some huge earthquakes in New Zealand in 2016 and these kelp populations were absolutely um, decimated by those earthquakes. So I'm just about to show you a photo of, um, this is part of the uplifted rock platform. So that rock that I'm standing next to was um, several meters underwater before the earthquake. That whole rock platform popped up six meters. So all of a sudden you had all these seaweeds that were down below the water, sitting high up above the water, and they all died. So along that stretch of coast, there's no seaweed left. And in some places, um, there are groups who are trying to plant seaweed to try to bring it back to those stretches of coast. Although it can kind of float down there itself anyway. So it's possible for the, for the kelp to get back in there and recolonize. I can show you a few more photos from that massive earthquake event. This is, um, why isn't that working? Share. Yeah. This is a landslide um, that occurred during the earthquake and you can see it completely blocked um, the highway and the railway track going up. So it was a huge impact on the local communities. Could why is seaweed important? That section that you just showed us with the big rock uplift. There's no seaweed there anymore, as you say. Who's missing out? What job isn't being done because the seaweed's not there? The seaweed's really important as a food source for a lot of animals. There are small invertebrates that live in the holdfasts um, and eat the kelp. And uh, it's also important as habitat. So it protects, it sort of protects a lot of small plants and animals from the impact of the waves. So the large kelps essentially form a forest that things can live in. Um, so until it comes back along those rock platforms, the whole ecosystem is disrupted. There are some species that have hung in there, but for many, um, it's no longer a good place to live. Mm -hmm. So along hundreds of kilometers of coast where that earthquake struck, um, the, the intertidal communities are decimated and it's gonna take some time for them to come back. The clock's just about to go 11.30. I'm aware our time is, is running out. Does anyone here at the Civic Centre have a question for, for Crid? I know uh, looks like George has just popped up with a question, but anyone here in the Civic Centre have a question for Crid? They've gone a bit shy, Crid. <laughs> well, let me take a look at this question um, from Georgia. It says, I was wondering what you may have been involved in during undergrad. I'm in my second year studying environment science by distance. Um, and I'm having a hard time finding ways to be involved in research and meet other scientists and gain some work experience. So um, during undergrad, I used my holidays to try to get some hands-on experience. Um, so at the time, as now, I was fascinated by subantarctic environments and penguins. So I contacted um, a research center at Phillip Island where they work on penguins and um, a range of other interesting plants and animals. And I said, can I come and be a volunteer? And they said, yes. So I went down there and that turned into a paid job after a while. So um, I spent a couple of summers down at Phillip Island um, working with the penguin colony there. And, and then I did a similar thing with inland New South Wales fisheries over across the summer. I worked um, with fisheries um, I wasn't paid much, but it was, I basically got free accommodation and free food, but it gave me contacts and experience that helped to um, tell, it helped to let me know what I was most excited in, but it also helped to um, show 
future employers that I had some experience in working in those areas. So it can be hard if you feel a bit out of the loop. And um, I guess, Georgia, if you can, it might be a good idea to try to, to, to find a way to work um, at a university directly where they are doing more hands-on um, work. And of course, the Sapphire Coast Marine Discovery Centre Marine Science Forum is coming up on the 25th of May at Club Sapphire in Marimbula. Uh, it'll be huge in terms of feeding that passion for science and for networking, meeting people that perhaps can take you further on your scientific journey. If you want to know some more info about the Marine Science Forum, just head to the website of the Sapphire Coast Marine Discovery Centre. Any questions here from Bega High School students at the Civic Centre? Let me bring you the microphone. What's your name? Karma. Tell us your question for Crid Karma. Um, so like with the ecosystems, how does the kelp moving further down, um, down like affect the ecosystems that live off the kelp? Uh, all of, thanks Karma. All of the species that are associated with that species of kelp will also have to shift south with it. Um, that could have flow on effects to some of the fisheries. It's hard to be sure. We don't really know enough about the complexity of the marine ecosystems in that part of the world to know exactly what the impacts will be. But I would say that the entire ecosystems are going to shift south. And we're seeing um, not just kelp, but many, many other plants and animals shifting south. So we'll see a change. It's kind of called a tropicalization of temperate regions where we start to see um, around Sydney, for example, things are getting much more tropical. Um, we're starting to see a lot of plants and animals moving into Canberra that used to only be found in Sydney. Um, so, so it's essentially all of the environments of the world shifting polewards a little bit. Some of them are going up mountains instead where they can, because you also get cooler temperatures by going to higher altitudes. Crit, are there opportunities that come with that as well? Opportunities for the plants and animals? And for people, industry as well, perhaps? Uh, yes, I, I think there will be. The, the trouble is that a lot of this is happening so quickly that it's hard for us to um, adjust in time. So we still tend to think of things as um, invasive pests when they turn up somewhere that they didn't used to live. And that can be a problem with, with plants and animals shifting with climate change. So let's say we've got a national park and suddenly a plant turns up in it that wasn't there before. Our automatic response is to say, oh no, it's a weed, dig it out, get rid of it but that might be the only place that that plant can survive in future. So we might need to change our ideas uh, about what is, um, what is a native species um, in, in a particular area and start to accept that plants and animals are gonna be moving a lot in the near future. And we've seen that with um, flying foxes, for example, in Australia, yes. where there's been a lot of public outcry when suddenly flying foxes move into a new area and they're eating all the fruit but those flying foxes are dropping dead further north where it's suddenly too hot for them. So they're trying to find climates that they can live in. And that means that they're turning up in places they didn't live in before. Any other questions here from being a high school students yet? We've got another question. What's your name? Um, my name's Emily. Um, and my question was, so with the population of um, like the kelp and other species moving downwards towards the colder climates, are we going to find like that, um, up further that it's going to be like um, a lot less animals and it may become deserted or will like more tropical species start to like um, go there? Nice question. Thank you. Certainly I think in the intermediate zones we will get a lot more tropical species turning up and and so they could be winners in this situation. Um, a lot of it depends on how well plants and animals can move. And that's something that my research is um, really focused on. As I said, for some of the plants and animals in Southern Australia, if they're trying to move South, they have to be able to cross an ocean and not all of them will be able to cross an ocean. And that's true also further North where if you've got um, climates that are warming and you want more tropical species to come in from further North, it might not always be possible for them to make that leap or there might be habitat breaks that they can't cross, like species that occur only on a rock platform and then there's a very, very long beach. They have to have some way of crossing that beach and getting to the other end. And I guess in the past, because climate changed much more slowly in the past, they had time for random chance to pick them up and move them, like a bird could land, pick up an, an egg and, and shift it. 
it might only happen once every thousand years, but it would happen often enough. But now things are happening so fast that for many plants and animals, they won't have time for those random chances to shift them. So we might actually have to think in, in terms of management of picking up some communities and shifting them to new environments that they can live in, which again goes against everything that we normally think of in terms of conservation. We wanna keep things as they are, but we can't keep things as they are into the future. So we might need to help them to change. We're in this tricky balance where man has caused all these problems and now man needs to try and act to help the environment. That's right. And unfortunately, it's generally the charismatic species that get more attention. So something like a penguin will always make the news for uh, if there's some climate impact on its distribution. Things like sea slugs get a lot less, <laughs> a lot less press. But we still need to think about shifting those entire ecosystems because they're all interconnected. Any other questions from students here? Oh, great. Oh, I'll come back. <laughs> What's your name? Freya. Um, when did you start noticing the southerly movement of all these plants and animals? Thanks, Freya. Uh, well, it's been happening for some time. Um, there hasn't been a lot of baseline data that we can go on to, to really be sure exactly how widespread it is. There's a paper from 2011 that really nicely summarised some of the southward shifts for hundreds of species along the east coast of Australia. So they looked at historical records to find out you know, where they used to be in the 1940s and then the 1980s and so on, and then compared it to where they are now and showed that many plants and animals along the coast, so the intertidal sorts of plants and animals, are shifting south, sometimes by hundreds of kilometres um, in the last few decades. So it's been happening probably for most of my life and it just seems to be accelerating now. Um, for this bull kelp, we've known for at least 10 years that it's shifting south, um, but we can see genetically that it's happened in the past with past climate change too. One more question. And so with all the populations, uh, like all those species moving, moving um, further downwards, are we gonna find that there's like overpopulation in the areas? In some cases that can happen. You can get species moving in that cause problems for the local ecosystem. Um, but in, in many cases, it's just gonna be a southward shift of everything. So it's not gonna be one or two plants and animals that are shifting south and disrupting new, new ecosystems. It's gonna be sort of the whole suite of ecosystems shifting south. So they probably won't impact each other too much. But, but certainly Tasmania's having some problems at the moment with um, changes, warming water and the impacts of that on uh, giant kelp forests, um, also ur urchin explosions that are impacting the kelp forests. So sometimes you get just, you know, one species that'll change and it'll, it'll have massive flow on effects for the rest of the ecosystem. Any more questions? No? How's the rest of your day looking, Crid? What, what happens now? What have you got to work on this afternoon in, in your time? Well, it's Friday afternoon, and now that I've driven out to this marine research centre, <laughs> I don't think I'll rush back in. It's lovely out here. Normally, I work in an office in, in town, which is not quite as beautiful. So I'll stay out here. I've got my laptop, and I'll work on some papers until it's um, beer o'clock, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy that beer this afternoon, Chris. Thank you so much for sharing your, your time, your passion, and your knowledge with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. That's Associate Professor with the Department of Marine Science at the University of Otago in New Zealand, Crid Fraser. Thank you so much again, Crid, and thank you also to Doug Record and the team at the Bournder Environment Education Centre and Jerry and the team here at the Bega Civic Centre. Thanks. Now, I thought if you've got time, I might just finish with a very short video I took of a plane taking off from Antarctica and right at the end it kind of flies over a cliff. So let me see if I can get this working. I don't know how well this is going to work. So this is a runway in Antarctica. It's basically just made of dirt and ice. And the plane kind of rattles along it with gravel flying up and snow flying up everywhere. And then at the end, we basically just take off um, right over a cliff. <laughs> wow. 
another world. So removed from what we know here on the <laughs> coast of New South Wales. <laughs> I thought that would be a good one, good one to finish on, <laughs> jumping off a cliff. Thanks again, Craig. Cheers. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, all of you. Bye-bye.